So I want to just build on uh, on some of the ideas that uh, Beth just shared with us, and uh, and think about uh, what we want to talk about today, but also a little bit the the evolution of of Feed the Future itself as a as an anti-hunger uh, poverty initiative. So here's the way I like to think about it, uh, thinking about food security in the large and the small. So when we think about food security in the large, we often focus on the global food supply. Uh, we, a lot of us see the number nine, million, 9 billion people will need to eat by the year 2050. My own university put a very large uh, billboard out on Interstate 80 near Sacramento that said, table for nine billion, comma, please. Uh, and, and that kind of thinking uh, is, is obviously very important. I mean, the world population is growing. We do need to have enough food. We do need to have that table filled for the 9 billion people. At the same time, when we talk about food security, we also talk about food security in the small, sort of at the microeconomic level. And here I've slightly misquoted one of my uh, economic culture heroes, Amartya Sen, who, who said, he actually said starvation. He had a book called Poverty and Famines, which some of you may know. But he said, uh, misquoting him slightly, food security is the characteristic of some people not having enough food to eat. It is not the characteristic of there not being enough food to eat. And so this notion, I'm not trying to, to say that the uh, in the large is not important, but clearly when we talk about fun hunger, we talk about stunting, we talk about chronic food insecurity for some families. We're really talking in the small, and we need to sort of think at that level uh, as well. Um, I was participating in a kickoff session for Feed the Future version 1.0. It was about five years ago, six years ago. I've lost track. Uh, at that time, Thomas Lumpkin, who was director of CIMIT, guesstimated that the average smallholder in the world was producing at about 30 percent of the level that was technologically possible. I have no idea where he got that number, but I'm glad he said it and glad he was director of a big institute like CIMIT so I could quote it and make it sound, make it sound credible. Uh, but the idea that the technological frontier is up here, most small farmers like the woman in the picture bef before us, by the way, that's a, she's a woman in Mozambique, and if she's like everybody else in our sample, she's producing less than a ton per hectare of maize in an environment where people could rather easily produce four times, five times that amount, right? But this idea that there's this gigantic gap between what's technologically possible and what small farmers are actually doing, I think is, is a really important part of understanding food insecurity uh, in the small. And I think Feed the Future uh, 1, version 1.0, and a lot of other efforts have, have, I think, with good justification, worked a lot at raising the ceiling. New technology, new breeding technologies, let's push it up, let's, let's make sure we have the food available for the table for 9 billion. But at the same time, we have just a very large numbers of producers who are so far short of the ceiling that raising the ceiling seems somewhat irrelevant to what they're doing. And that's really where this conference came about. And as Beth has already alluded, if you look at the new uh, the Feed the Future Strategy version 2.0, uh, you, you see that it actually pays much more attention to issues like resilience, to sustaining growth, to agricultural-led inclusive growth that brings along everybody with the process of technological change and economic growth. So these are really important. Uh, I think these are, 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 are a really important evolution in, in the think, thinking that underlies Feed the Future. So when we put this conference together, we thought it would be a, this was a particularly good moment to sort of step back a little bit and ask ourselves, what is it we really understand about the yield gap, and what do we understand about what works to close that yield gap, to, to move that woman from 700 kg of maize per hectare towards the, the three and a half tons that is, would seem to be technologically feasible uh, for her. So when we thought about this, um, we came up with three sort of very general areas to think about. So the first is risk and liquidity constraints. So are these things that prevent people from making the investment? They either don't have the money, or if they have the money, they need to hold it in a form that secures their, uh, secures the family well-being in case the crop actually fails. So that's one broad area of work. Another I've, I've labeled here uh, knowledge and decision-making constraints. So. Uh, those of us who are economists at least have very stylized ways of thinking about how people very cleverly manage their and assemble their portfolios, but we know that in fact real people don't actually behave in exactly uh, that way. Uh, even our own students, I think, typically de demonstrate that to us on every exam that we, <laughs> that we write for them. So there's a lot of very, very interesting work out there about how people learn, how do they actually make their decisions in the face of risk. And once we understand that better, that often, as we'll see, opens up doors to new and better ways of, of doing things. And the, and the third one is, is actually this idea that, that maybe some of those technologies really are not profitable 
given the economic and agroecological conditions that, that farmers face. Maybe the soils are not fertilizer responsive. Maybe, you know, uh, Beth mentioned the Norman, uh, the Norman Borlaug Field Award that was won by uh, Andrew Mude. Uh, Norman Borlaug is frequently uh, quoted for having said that, uh, you know, hybrid seeds are the engine for reducing poverty and fertilizer is the gasoline that goes into that engine. But if you, in fact, have soils that are not fertilizer responsive, then maybe another reason for the yield gap is the technologies themselves have not been fine-tuned or developed correctly for the kinds of environments in which people find themselves. So that's another uh, area where there's been a lot of work. So we decided to do this, and our, and our format for today <coughs> which I should say we developed with Lena Heron, who's currently on leave, but she's the USAID uh, person who's, who's overseen, I guess is the right word, the, the basis program for a long time. We decided what we would try to do is, is invite three very distinguished academics who've worked in each of these areas and ask them to give us kind of a, an overview of, of what we know. 